Making everyone happy on vacation isn't easy, but you know what is? Going to Aruba. All you have to do is walk out your door to find pristine pools, relaxing white sand beaches, and an island teeming with outdoor activities that'll put a smile on any face. You won't just feel great, you'll all feel great, filled with a calmer, more peaceful vibe that radiates Aruba's warmth. And the best part is, it never fades. That's the Aruba effect. Plan your family trip at aruba.com. Leadership is not really associated with popularity. It's more associated with likability in terms of the research, which are these things that I'm talking about. The ability to connect, the ability to see people for who they are, the ability to be interested in other people's qualities and skills and accomplishments. So just keep that in mind. Welcome to season six of Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about a family's anxiety and all the big feelings too. We tackle the serious stuff without being too serious and I'm your co-host, Robin. I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author. And I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a fluster clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. I'll give you concrete steps to take and the words to say. Hi, Robin. Hi, Lynn. How's it going? It's going well. I think this might be our last Sunday of dreary weather. Oh, it's not dreary here. It's actually the sun is shining and it looks a little better. Yesterday was totally dreary. Well, and this is interesting because you and I live about an hour apart and yet the weather can be so different at your house and my house. So such is the nature of living in New England. So yes, I'm looking forward to spring. I've noticed the change in the light, which is really helpful just in general. Yes, no, it is. And the pull to be outside for me, since I don't love cold weather, I just feel the pull to be outside more and more now. The hibernating feeling is so yesterday. Now it's time to get outside. Correct. And as I often say, the research is very clear that you've got to get sunlight into your eyeballs and that being outside is good for your mood and for your joie de vivre. So it's good to be outside. It's good to get outside. So hibernating, except if you're a bear, is just not a great thing in general. In a previous episode, we were talking about kids that were having some difficulty with connection, with friendships, because they were kind of rigid and global. But we did talk quite a bit in that episode about the concept of likability, which sometimes, you know, makes people cringe a little bit. Like, what do you mean likability? My kid's not likable or I'm not likable. But it really is something that we can talk about in a pretty concrete way because likability means the ability to connect. Likability means that other people want to spend time with you or that you have a better likelihood of making friendships and connections, which we know is just so important to tribal social human beings. For the people who don't know where you're coming from, why don't you clarify that you're not talking about, and I use this in air quotes, you're not talking about helping your kids become the popular kids. That's not what this is about at all. That's not what this is about at all. And in fact, popularity and likability are two very different things. And so when you look at kids defining other kids as popular versus kids defining other kids as likable, they are very different things. There's a little bit of an overlap. But interestingly, when we're talking about popularity, we're talking about social influence. We're talking about the ability to be in charge, sometimes in not a good way. And there is research that says that popularity in kids actually correlates to aggression sometimes. What's interesting is that when I talk to kids and they say, oh, the popular kids, they often always say it in a way that's the opposite of what we think about as popular, right? Vanilla ice cream is the most popular ice cream. And people don't say like, vanilla ice cream. But when they're talking about popular kids, if you are not a air quote popular kid, you don't really feel good about the popular kids. What we look at is likability because those are the kids that treat other people kindly or equally versus popular kids where it's much more about a pecking order. The idea that popularity and influence are different than likability, what's I think very interesting is I'm not sure what grade it was, but there was a grade 
where both of my kids were very clear on the difference of the two. Yes. And a lot of the research, when they look at kids, they look at the difference between that elementary school age of like kids between the ages of six and 10 or 11, and then when they start looking at adolescents. So there are some differences in the research, which are boring to go into, but kids are pretty aware of the difference between popular and likable. And they see it as in terms of who feels intimidating who they want to be connected to. Now, kids want to be connected to the popular kids, but who do they feel comfortable going up to? Who do they perceive as being kind and being interested in them? That falls much more into the likable category. I don't know what your experience is as a parent. There's usually always one or two kids that the students would agree both labels apply. There are people who can be in the middle where they are in that group and they really are very socially skilled, likable human beings. So let's not paint a big, broad brush where you can't be both. But one of the things that I think is interesting over watching the course of the kids in my kids' classes is that the traits that would make one influential in elementary school shift a little in middle school and then again shift a little in high school. So if you have little kids, you know, that's one of the things to think about is that depending on your kids' personalities, there might be one age group and traits that suits your kid more. Yeah, for sure. And so really what I want to offer everybody listening today is... For those parents that are listening and saying like, gosh, my kid is shy or introverted, or my kid is never going to be the captain of the debate team, or my kid is never going to be the most popular kid. Really, what are the skills that you can teach your kids? What are the skills that you can model for your kids that really will help them connect? Because likability is really a measure of connection. It's really a measure of feeling as if you are connected to other people. It's about friendships. It's not about power, but it's about friendship. And it's about enjoying the company of others. And again, the research shows very, very clearly that isolation, lack of connectedness, an inability to find your tribe are really difficult things for human beings at all ages and elementary through adulthood. Maybe we can take a break and come back and I'll start going through some of the things that the research is very clear about and how you can begin to introduce those to your kids. How are those New Year's resolutions going? Well, many are destined to fail, but lucky for you, here's one easy resolution idea that we gave you that we can all make and it will make your life easier. It'll be kinder to our planet and it will transform the way you do laundry in 2024. And that is switching to EarthBreeze. EarthBreeze looks like dryer sheets, but it's ultra concentrated laundry detergent and it couldn't be easier. You just throw a sheet in with your laundry in any temperature and you watch it dissolve in any wash cycle hot or cold. There's no measuring, there's no mess, there's no fuss, there's no wasteful plastic jug. EarthBreeze fights everyday stains and odors, giving you an amazing clean every time. The best part is you'll never run out again thanks to EarthBreeze flexible subscription that you can adjust, pause, or cancel at any time with no hidden fees or penalties. And you'll save a whopping 40% when you subscribe. Shipping's always free, and it comes in a slim cardboard envelope that saves a ton of space. So switching to EarthBreeze won't only make Make laundry day easier for you, but it will also be easier on the planet. So help me make plastic jugs a thing of the past. And if Earth Breeze doesn't end up being the 2024 update of your dreams, you don't even have to return it. Just let them know it's not for you and you'll get a full refund, no questions asked. Get started with Earth Breeze and save 40%. Go to earthbreeze.com slash flusterclucks. That's earthbreeze.com slash flusterclucks for 40% off your subscription. Do you think seeing a therapist or a psychiatrist would be helpful, but you don't have the time to actually find one? And then like, when do you have time to meet with them? Try Talkspace. By doing everything online, Talkspace has made getting the help you want easy, accessible, and affordable. 
It's in network with most major insurers. There's no need to commute to appointments. You won't miss time at work or have to line up childcare in order to attend sessions. It's mental health care made easy. Talkspace lets you send messages to your therapist so you don't have to wait for your next session. Therapy can help you shift your perspective and find tools to cope in difficult times. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, substance abuse, relationship issues, and much more. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $80 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash Fluster. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com slash Fluster to get $80 off your first month. That's Talkspace.com slash Fluster. This message is sponsored by Greenlight. So when you're a parent, you're going to have your fair share of big talks with your kids, right? About all sorts of big topics. One of those big talks should involve money. And Greenlight can help with that. Greenlight is a debit card and a money app that's made for families. It allows you to do instant money transfers. You can get real-time notifications of spending. You can manage chores. You can automate allowance. I know with my kids, we really wanted to help them see the cause and effect, right? If you spend money now, you're not going to have it later. If you earn money now and you save it, maybe you can put it towards some big purchase that you're looking forward to. This is called financial literacy, and it allows kids to build independence, to learn how money works, to make them better savers, better spenders. The Greenlight app also comes with an in-app financial literacy game. It's called Level Up, so that kids can build money confidence through videos, bite-sized challenges, mini games, and more. More than 6 million parents and kids use Greenlight to learn how to make responsible financial choices. So stop putting off the money talk and start putting your kids on the right path. Sign up for Greenlight today and get your first month free at greenlight.com slash fluster. That's greenlight.com slash fluster to try Greenlight for free. Greenlight.com slash fluster. Okay, we're back. I have a question before we sort of get going. I can imagine we have a big range of experiences from our listeners right now, because realistically, all the kids might be falling into different places. And even within one family, they have so many different personality types. One of the things that I think might be helpful so that the parents are not listening to this from a place of concern and panic and worry, but being in a more constructive mindset, talk a little bit about the simplicity of what these goals actually are, because it's really about the ability to connect with one or two friends, or some family. It's not about getting your kid on top of a pecking order. Correct. Again, it is not about popularity. It's also not about quantity. It's about quality. It's about moving through the world in a way that makes you feel as you're maybe getting your first job, as you're starting a new school, as you're going to camp for the first time. Your ability to be in the social world in a way that offers opportunities for you to create deeper connection. And and the caveat is when you find your people too, because I think that's the biggest thing too, is you have a unique kind of kid and maybe the small elementary school doesn't have a ton of kids like your kid. How do you give them the skills so that when they are at a new day camp or they're in high school or college, they find their people and they know what to do then? Exactly. Because what happens, particularly if somebody is a little shy or socially anxious, is that they don't even know what the first steps are. I'll give you an example. I did a group for young adults. They were like 18 to 22, where they were having a lot of social anxiety. And one of their biggest fears when they came in here, one of the skills they didn't feel that they had was how to keep a conversation going. They were lovely human beings and they were sweet and they were kind and they were empathic, but they just needed some help in very concrete skills of how do I create an environment where deeper connection is possible. So we've talked in the past about one of the things if you have a child that's having social difficulties is to make sure that you are offering them opportunities where there's people traffic. So you want them engaged in activities or you want to try different things. So let's say step one is that you're putting them with other kids. And then step two is what are the things that we can teach and model that then allow for this opportunity to create connection? 
And the things that I'm about to list are actually things that the research shows increase the likelihood of you creating deeper connection. And by deeper connection, I don't mean that you're looking for your life partner. It's that you make friends that then you can hang out with and enjoy your time with. Because isolation is bad and connection is good. And so that's what we're going to talk about. I also think it's important for us to talk about, just to put this in the context of we've got kids that are so used to using phones and screens for a lot of their communication and a lot of their interaction. A lot of these skills actually have to do with real life face-to-face interaction, which I think parents really need to pay attention to. These are just concrete skills that we want to think about that maybe if you're listening as an adult, these were things that were sort of taken for granted when you were growing up, but not aren't happening very much anymore from my experience. Number one, how do you introduce yourself to others? And how do you introduce people when you're in a group? Kids oftentimes don't have the language to do that. And so it has to be modeled by us. Very simply, When you're taking your kids out in the world to even prompt them and practice saying, okay, so when we meet somebody, we say, hi, my name is blank. What's your name? Or you're introducing somebody else. This is my friend, Robin, and we've known each other for a long time. Robin, this is Sam. You're giving kids the language And you're showing them how it is that when you're meeting new people or when you're introducing people, how do you make that connection? That's something that a lot of kids are not experienced with and they need help and they need modeling doing that. So you can practice that. You can role play that. We just rewatched Bridget Jones' Diary, and that's actually like a scene in that movie where they're giving Bridget tips to go to this work event and introduce people with thoughtful details. I think that it's so helpful when we talk about social skills with our kids that we say, like, as adults, we're always learning and sharpening these skills, too. Yep, that's right. And in a previous episode, we talked about the importance of asking for help as one of the really important skills in life. And so that's another thing that you can begin to work on with your child is how do you have them in a grocery store? You can't find something. How do you have them go up to the customer service desk or go up to somebody who's stocking the shelves and say, excuse me, can you tell me where the Greek yogurt is? So being able to give your kids practice in interacting, this includes eye contact. This includes maybe you're going to teach them how to shake hands. So how do you go in and have a firm grip? How do you put yourself into a situation where people don't know you or where you're meeting somebody or your friends are meeting somebody and you take the initiative to make that initial connection? That's a very important skill that we want kids to practice two great places that you can let your kids practice this. If you have a Trader Joe's in your community, there is a basket of lollipops. And I made it a rule with my kids. If they wanted a lollipop, even from like age three, they had to go up, look at the customer service person in the eye and say, may I please have a lollipop? I would not ask for them. Right. The other thing, if you happen to be going to Disney, is there's this whole lovely tradition that I think is so good specifically because of this. It's called pin trading. And so cast members wear these different Disney pins. And if the child has a Disney pin, they can go up to the cast member and say, like, can we trade pins? Let your child go up to that cast member as you watch them manage those interactions. All of these opportunities where a child who's very young learns the ability to have some autonomy and have a nice little reward as well. Right. And so say you have a child who's sort of on the extreme where they have a really difficult time talking or they're super, super shy and quiet, role play, practice. Remember, the brain learns experientially. So say you're going to Disney and you tell them about this pin trading, practice it. Say you're going to a grocery store where they can get a sample. At Trader Joe's, there's a lollipop, but at our grocery store growing up, there was this little sample thing where you could get a little piece of cake or a little piece of cookie, and you had to go up and ask the person at the deli counter or the bakery counter for the sample. So there are all sorts of ways that you can look for 
opportunities for your kids to practice this. But if they're really on the extreme of being super quiet or super shy, give them some opportunities to role play it. And then maybe when you go into the store, you show them how to do it the first time and then they do it the next time. Really, really, you're looking for these opportunities for sure. Eye contact, introducing oneself to others, asking for things, teaching kids how to shake hands teaching kids how to ask questions, which we'll get to because that's a big thing coming up. And I'll talk more specifically about that in a moment. So let's talk about some of the ways that increase your likability. So you're with a group of friends. And remember, likability just means people want to connect with you. So what are the things that people do that we know make them more likable? Okay. Not more popular, more likable. There's a really interesting list of concrete things. One is that, and this is going to be a surprise to no one who listens to the podcast, you own your own stuff, which means that in little ways, you acknowledge mistakes when you do something wrong, you don't deny it, you don't try and talk your way out of it. And just so you know, everybody, when people make mistakes, then that makes them more likable. So if you spill your coffee on your lap, or if you are talking to somebody and spit comes out of your mouth, which happens to me a lot when I'm speaking, actually. I mean, not two people, but on a stage, like there's a light, there's the way the lighting is. And I will be talking and I will see a huge thing of spit come out of my mouth. And I will very often say, oh, I'm so sorry, everybody. Did you all see that spit come out of my mouth? Because I just saw it come out of my mouth. I just feel like I need to let you know that I saw it too. Everybody laughs, but if you trip and fall, if you burp accidentally, whatever it is that people do, sometimes you get the hiccups. I said, oh my gosh, everybody, I just have the hiccups right now. Being real about that is a perfectly fine thing to do, and it's okay to own that. And again, for kids that are socially anxious, they're so worried about judgment, they're so worried about somebody seeing their flaws, tell kids that actually that makes them more likable, that we like it when we admit our flaws or we point out our mistakes. I even wrote this in my grandfather's obituary. I think that both my grandfather and my mom, who were both very likable, like by definition, very, very liked and beloved in their peer communities, they were excellent at not taking themselves too seriously. That's one of the key things. Is And it's not that they were walking around being self-deprecating all the time. So my mom was of a certain generation in the South and was a perfectionist about her look. So she was definitely on the vain side. She would never leave the house without perfect hair or makeup, as would none of her friends. Yeah, same with me. <laughs> <laughs> if you know me, you know that that's why Robin's laughing. I've been wearing the same clothes since Friday, and it's now Sunday. <laughs> But so she was a perfectionist in certain ways, and we've talked about that. But she also, compared to her peers, she could laugh at herself. And so the difference between my mom and, say, the other ladies she played bridge with, right? My mom could like belly laugh at herself, and they all loved her for it. And other women in that group probably just couldn't. They were wired a little too tightly, a little too earnestly, but they loved that about my mom. And she really modeled that well. Yeah, that's such an important thing. We don't want to be self-deprecating to the point where we're always saying, oh, I'm such a loser, blah, blah, blah. But when you make a mistake, when you do something silly, when you know that there's some flaw that you have that's just everybody is noticing too, it's really okay, like you say, to laugh at yourself or to not take yourself so seriously. Yep, absolutely. So here's another thing that is really helpful is that offer genuine compliments to people. Now, there is a difference between being a suck-up, being an Eddie Haskell, again, dating ourselves with our pop culture references, but offering simple, genuine compliments to people is a really good skill to model for kids. So it can be quick. It can say, oh my gosh, I love your haircut, or oh cool, look, I love your nail color, or where did you get those shoes? Those are fantastic. Or, oh my gosh, that was such a great time that we had at your house. Thank you for being such a wonderful hostess. Some small little compliment that is genuine, not suck up it's not brown nosy, but just you drop those genuine compliments, that actually is a way to connect with other people. Even now, if I'm at a work event, then I don't really know anybody. But if someone's wearing something that I think is cool, 
then I would go up and say, I really love your bag. And I think it's so true to say, make sure you mean it. Otherwise, it doesn't sound as good. Right. So find something that you can mean. And then I would just go one step further that that's the introductory compliment. But with peers and with others, call them out for not like what they're wearing. But as you know, someone call them out for the good things that they did. Yep. Your song was really great that you did in music class. Your solo was good compliment people for what they're doing because it's meaningful. Right. It's meaningful. And then very closely related to that is that there's something, and I just came across this term and I love it. They called it good gossip because as human beings, we like to talk about other people and we all know what gossip is and we all know that it can be really toxic and really harmful and really hurtful. But good gossip is you're talking about other people in a positive way. You were, you know, working with somebody and then you were with some other work friends and you said, oh my gosh, I just have to tell you, I was at this presentation that Robin did. Man, she nailed it, like knocked it out of the park. Good gossip means that you say kind things about other people rather than saying mean or nasty things about other people. And making that as a practice, other people hear you doing that. It's the same with bad gossip, right? Have you ever had somebody who you, you're with and they are talking about people behind their back all the time? And you think, okay, so they're talking about me behind my back too, because that's their pattern. So when people hear you saying kind things about other people, it makes you more genuine. It makes you more trustworthy. And it shows that you are capable of recognizing the positive things about other people and that you are sharing them generously with the world. So that's another thing, good gossip. I love that phrase. I had not heard that before, but I love it. I think that's a really great trait for girls, young women, and women to do especially. Because if you are the person who is ready to stand up for your friends, you will attract better friends too. Yeah. And here's just a little aside for those of us that are listening that are women in business. Leadership is not really associated with popularity. It's more associated with likability in terms of the research, which are these things that I'm talking about. The ability to connect, the ability to see people for who they are, the ability to be interested in other people's qualities and skills and accomplishments. So just keep that in mind. Good gossip is really something that benefits us in all sorts of different ways. Even think about it in a family. You have somebody in a family who's sort of quick to throw somebody under the bus or to talk negatively about them. And it's so wonderful if you have a family that says, oh my gosh, did you hear the song that he just produced? Or did you see the blah, blah, blah? That was so cute. That is a way of creating positive connection for sure. Yeah. And you got to model that for your kids. We all can fall into that pattern of being negative and gossiping about people, of course, but we just have to make sure that we're not creating that as a constant pattern that we're showing our kids because that impacts likability. Yeah. If you feel like you might be more of a negative Nelly and you think that that's something you're trying to work on, then it's really important to model the alternative for your kids. Yeah. And whenever we're trying to change something, it does feel like it has to be a very conscious effort at first. You're creating a new pathway in your brain. You're doing something differently. It's like if you're working on your posture, you've really got to think about it consciously until it becomes more automatic. So that's something that you really want to pay attention to for sure. These are also things that, you know, in the episode that we were talking about being globally negative, if you've got a kid that tends to be more globally negative, it's really important that you make an effort to model these more positive and more connecting skills because global negativity really pushes people away. Which leads me to the next thing, which is that one of the things that impacts likability, impacts connection, is the mood that you convey to the world. So like it or not, I mean, look, this is what the research is saying. This is not about me judging. This is just what it says. And it makes sense is that people that are consistently grumpy, grouchy, mean, negative, depressed, all of those characteristics in somebody's general mood tend to impact whether or not people want to connect with you. So it doesn't mean put on a happy face, but it does sort of mean that the more that you put yourself out into the world and do and say and act in positive ways, the more likable you're going to be. And here's the kicker, everybody. 
oftentimes, just like we've talked about before with depression and other things, acting a certain way actually influences your internal environment. So people who act happy tend to be in better moods. Now, this is called behavioral activation. It's actually a treatment for depression in which we do things that give us positive feedback, whether or not we feel like doing them. I'm not saying that people should go out and be fake and be like, oh, hi, so nice to see you. But genuinely think, how can you go out in the world and engage in things that make you feel more positive because that will bring more positive people toward you? So I'm sure as I'm saying this, Robin, this is one of those things that can get really misinterpreted and misconstrued that people will say, oh, Lynn is telling people that they have to mask their emotions and to not share how they truly feel. No, what I am saying is that the research is clear that when you do positive things, when you behave in positive ways, it actually influences your mood. It's funny you say that because as you were talking about that step and that research, I had two different types of people pop into my head. And one of them is the one that you were talking about and the other one is not. So there could be someone who's kind of a little globally negative, a little bit of an Eeyore. And you're telling the Eeyore person who kind of likes to complain how to consciously try and connect people from something positive. That's what you're talking about. As opposed to the people who, as a fault that they also need to work on, they sort of disconnect from their feelings and sort of remain in an inauthentic space most of the time. Correct. As you're saying this, right, I have a friend that I've had for a long time who really just bitches about things all the time. If I go on a walk with her, or if I spend time with her, I have to sort of accept that I'm just going to hear her. She gossips negatively about people. She loves to point out the bad things about people. And she bitches about things. Like in kind of almost like a stand-up comedy routine. It's not very funny, but it's not a conversation. There's many, many things that I enjoy about her, but this is one of the things that stands out for me when I spend time with her. So it's something to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. We'll take a little break and then I will talk about the last big thing. I am really working on improving my diet by making sure that I get the best quality products, organic foods. And I really want to make sure that I'm not using harsh chemicals in my home. Thrive Market is my go-to for all of my grocery and household essentials. The convenience of getting everything online and then quickly shipped to my doorstep, that is a huge time saver. I love that Thrive Market carries brands with the highest quality ingredients and sourcing methods. They restrict hundreds of ingredients across their food and cleaning categories. I can use their filters to suit my lifestyle needs. So maybe you're looking for organic snacks for your kids, or maybe you're gluten-free. As a Thrive Market member, I save money on every single grocery order. You will too. On average, I save over 30% each time. They even have a deals page that changes daily, always has some of my favorite brands. When you join Thrive Market, you're also helping a family in need with their one-for-one membership matching program. You join, they give. So join in on the savings with Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash flusterclux for 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. That's T H R I V E market dot com slash flusterclux. Thrive market dot com slash flusterclux. If you've got kids at home, I think you probably feel like you're feeding them all the time. It's just trying to come up with good recipes, good food, things they'll eat. Well, There's a great podcast. It's called Didn't I Just Feed You? It's a weekly podcast. It's hosted by longtime food professionals, Stacey Billis and Megan Splawn. And it's about feeding our families. It's even for parents who hate to cook because really, kids eat a lot. So every week, Stacy and Megan get real about feeding kids, tweens, and teens from how to turn nachos into a family dinner 
that sounds good, to the magic of meatballs, or dealing with that after-school snack problem. They talk about coping with picky eaters and the mental load of being the family cook, all as part of their mission to make cooking easier, more delicious, and maybe even fun. So Didn't I Just Feed You is available on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or anywhere you get your favorite podcast. You can learn more on didn't I just feed you.com or find them on Instagram as at didn't I just feed you. You're really going to enjoy listening to Stacy and Megan. They're going to help you out. And isn't that what podcasts are all about? Okay, so now back to the show. Okay, I often say this the meat of the sandwich, but here's a really, really concrete thing that you can teach your kids and that you can pay attention for yourself. That in everything that I looked at, in terms of likability and connection, this was at the top of the list. Okay, you ready? I'm ready. It's about asking questions of other people. Now, that sounds simple, right? So you ask people a question, but there are some important components of it that are really interesting and I think really helpful. One is that you ask a question about the person and you try and make it kind of specific about their interests or something. So you don't say, oh, how are you doing? That's too general. You certainly don't ask a yes or no question. Do you like giraffes, right? The new season of Love on the Spectrum came out and they always have somebody coaching them about how to ask questions. And then they work very hard on not asking the yes or no questions or the open-ended questions. We've talked about it before because it really shows you don't have to be on the spectrum to gain from learning and improving social skills. Right. So if you haven't seen Love on the Spectrum, it's a lovely series where they have young adults that are looking for relationships. And these people are on the spectrum. So they're learning skills. So there's a coach that comes in. They're going on dates. They're really learning concretely how to connect with people and what the do's and don'ts are of interactions. And it's also just lovely because the thing that I always like about this, and I know that they pick and choose the families, of course, but the families are so supportive. The families are so loving and also the families delight in their children. So there is usually a lot of laughter. There's usually a lot of, like we were saying, not taking yourself too seriously. And they really just enjoy each other. So it's just a lovely thing. If you're looking for a show to watch with your kids, if you have tweens or kids, it's just a lovely family show. That's how I experience it. Definitely. And if you're a family where you feel like you need to talk a lot about building these skills, it's a great launch pad for conversations to watch these episodes with your children. Yeah. I would say as early as elementary school, for sure. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's just a lovely show and it's done really well and it's done so empathically, just with so much kindness. Okay. So asking questions. And one of the things about asking questions is you want to take on this stance of curiosity. So you ask a question about something about them. And then here is a real key. This is such a good tip is that then when they answer, you ask a follow-up question. And I don't think that that's a skill that we talk to very directly about with our kids and even ourselves. All right. So let's just do a little example. So I say to you, Robin, so what do you best like about Paris? I really love walking around along the sides of the river because it's so beautiful. Oh, so can you tell me some, one of those walks that you've taken, what was the highlight of that? Like what's some moment that just stands out for you? One of the best places to practice this for little kids is with the relatives in the bigger family, mm -hmm. talking to grandparents, aunts and uncles, older cousins. That's a patient audience, typically, <laughs> where those six, seven and eight year olds could have that kind of conversation. Yes, that's exactly correct because they feel a little more comfortable to begin with and it's a good way to practice it. So for example, say you've got a child and you're trying to, they're saying like, well, we're going to go see our cousins. And so you might prompt them a little bit and you say, remember, like your cousin Joshua is on his robotics team and he's really into it. So when you see him, you can ask him a question about his robotics team and then you ask him another question. So that would sound like, so do you like being on your robotics team? And then Joshua says, yes, it's really fun, right? And then the person's like, 
Okay, now what do we say? So then you say, tell me about your last competition or what's the most fun part of it for you? And so you're teaching kids how to keep a conversation going by asking questions. And one of the things that is interesting about that is that people tend not to believe that this is one of the things that works. Like if you talk to people about likability and if you say to them, well, you ask questions about other people, a lot of people are like, no, 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 that doesn't work. So they don't do it. People don't do it. So you're really giving your kid a really good skill and kind of a leg up on something that a lot of people don't do. One of the things I think you could tell your kids, because you love this and you talk about this a lot, is tell your kids to always lead with the how question, not a yes or no question. Correct. And it engages people. Like if I said to you, if you're talking about a trip that you did, and if I said to you, how do you find the best places to eat when you're traveling? And then you have to explain something to me. And it also gives somebody an opportunity to talk about something that they know about, maybe something that they're good at. So they're sharing something that's important to them. So yeah, that's a great tip. The thing that people do oftentimes that is kind of on the don't list, say I said to you, I mean, I'm just making something up, how did your root canal go? And then one of the things that people do is then they talk about their root canal. So if I said, how did your root canal go? And you go, oh, well, it was pretty good. I mean, it took longer than I thought and blah, blah, blah. And then I say, yeah, my root canal took two hours and blah, blah, blah. So we start talking about ourselves too quickly. So that's why this ask two questions before you offer your own experience is kind of a good little rule of thumb to help people get engaged. Yep. So you ask two questions. Sort of the flip side of this is that when we ask people about themselves and they share things about themselves, one of the things that consistently shows up that makes you not so likable is when you talk a lot about yourself. And we certainly know people who do that. So you meet them and they're just going to give you this monologue about what they've done and they never ask a question about you, right? So that friend that I was talking about, she doesn't usually ask about how my life is going. So it's hard. I mean, I love her, but it's hard. This is something that we can really talk to our kids about directly. And that's one of the things that I think I emphasize a lot, but I just want to be really clear about is that it's okay for you to just give your kids this help and these instructions. It's okay for you to teach them these things, and it's okay for you to practice these things. And modeling is super, super important, but the extra juice of it is for you to really lay it out for them, particularly if you have kids that struggle with this. Give them the playbook. Give them the playbook. And you watch Love on the Spectrum, and then you have an opportunity to talk about it. I know sometimes I feel contradictory because I say talk 85% less. Don't overload them with it. Don't talk about it to them for an hour. But remember, you are a seed planter. So look for opportunities to just mention these things, point out these things, do a little role play. This is a long-term process, and we're always working on it. And everybody is figuring these things out for sure. I want to talk about the parents for a second. Okay. When I had young children and I was often isolated with young kids and I would meet up with a friend or go to a playground, the desire to connect with an adult was really big. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember that so clearly. Oh, yeah. And I think that it's really easy for moms trying to make other mom friends. It's really easy to lead with the monologue because you're just so excited to talk to a grown up. The further away I got from that phase, I had a little more self-control of recognizing like, okay, I'm out with this friend now in my head. I'm going to talk about, I want to share this and then I'm going to mm -hmm. shut up. Right, right. <laughs> right. I would say that even we listening to this have to think about the give and take in a conversation, even as adults. And I think that when we're present and really connecting with someone in an authentic way, that's obviously when the conversation just flows organically and ideally, but we're not always in that great state. Well, especially at the beginning of a relationship, we feel more pressure, like you said, like we're just desperate to talk to somebody and have something in common and share things. If as you're starting new relationships, if you're feeling isolated, if you as a parent are listening to this and you're thinking, oh gosh, these are skills I don't have, keep it simple for yourself. 
even if you follow this rule of I'm going to ask a how question, and then before I start talking about myself and saying, oh, I had the same situation, ask another how question and then see if that makes a difference. It also means that you go into these interactions with a bit of a plan, which can feel really helpful if you're somebody who's socially anxious and like my group, they were so worried that they wouldn't be able to keep a conversation going. These are just some really good tips for bringing people closer into your orbit rather than for you staying isolated, for sure. And then for the socially more anxious, just a reminder to those adults who feel kind of shy and intimidated in those circumstances, those how questions and questions are great. It's okay to have some moments of silence in a conversation. That's right. Yeah. I think on Love of the Spectrum, they were sitting talking and then one of the persons said, I'm sure that they were taught about this. He goes, awkward silence. He just said it out loud. They were sitting there. They didn't know what to say. It was kind of funny. It was kind of cute. Silences don't have to be awkward is all I was trying to say. Yes, I know. That's one of the things you learn in psychotherapy school very early on is that it's okay to sit in silence. It's hard for us. We think we're supposed to keep the conversation going, that you're supposed to say something meaningful, that you have to be engaged and connected at every single minute. And that's not true. That's why sometimes just walking with your child in silence can be a really, really connecting experience. You don't have to talk about something all the time or have something to say all the time. Yeah. And that's where Talk 85% Less does come in. That does. Yeah. Because we tend to sort of talk at our kids and lecture our kids and we feel pressured or we feel pressed to solve the problem and to figure out what it is and to give advice and blah, 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 blah. When you're asking questions, you're not giving advice. You're being curious. That's a good stance to take when you're meeting people or when you're engaging with people, for sure. That's a Ted Lasso. Be curious, not judgmental. Oh, really? That's a Ted Lasso? You don't remember? That was a really great one. Be curious, not judgmental. I got to go back and watch Ted Lasso again from the beginning. Yeah, I'm going to do that this summer. My memory is so lousy anyway that I'm sure I would watch them and they would be new to me. It would be, <laughs> it would be good, for sure. Thanks for listening. And if you found this podcast helpful, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other people find this information. And if you'd like to dig deeper on any of these topics, we have specialized playlists on our Spotify profile and the link is in the show notes. Topics like teens, depression, and OCD. Bye, Lynn. Bye, Robin. Hey there, I'm Debbie Reber, the founder of Tilt Parenting and the author of the book, Differently Wired. The mission of TILT is to change the way neurodivergence, whether that's having a learning disability, having ADHD, being gifted, autistic, or some combination of all of the above, is perceived and experienced so differently wired kids and the parents like us raising them can truly thrive. On the TILT Parenting Podcast, I get to talk with authors, therapists, educators, and parenting experts who are committed to this mission. I ask the questions my listeners are most curious about when it comes to supporting our kids. And in turn, my guests share strategies for challenges, out-of-the-box ideas for navigating school, best practices for therapies, tips for advocating, and so many thoughtful insights on what it really takes to help our kids grow up feeling seen and respected so they can create awesome lives for themselves. I know that raising a differently wired kid can feel overwhelming and isolating, but I promise you, you are not alone, and it can feel so much better. If you're on this parenting journey, come listen to Tilt Parenting. Together, we can shift this paradigm and show up for our exceptional kids with hope, possibility, and joy.